Uh, Mr. Green is the director of the site and division. To my right is Dean Hazel. Uh, Mr. Hazel is a regional planner with the siting division. And to his right is Wayne Wang, also a regional planner for the siting board. Also with us here this evening, um, out at the table that I've been referring to is, the, is Joan Evans, and Ms. Evans is the general counsel for the siting board. Northeast Energy Center, or NEC, is proposing to construct a new facility in the town of Charlton that would be able to liquefy natural gas, or LNG, store the LNG on site, and then load the liquefied gas onto trucks for delivery to NEC gas customers, such as National Grid. NEC has filed two petitions with the Siting Board in connection with its proposed facility. One petition seeks approval from the Siting Board to construct the facility on one of three proposed sites. The other petition seek, seeks certain ex individual zoning exemptions and a comprehensive exemption from the Town of Charlton zoning bylaw again, to allow construction and operation of the proposed facility. Tonight, after my introductory remarks, NEC will make a presentation regarding its proposed facility. After NEC's presentation, those who have signed up on the speaker sign-up sheet will have the opportunity to ask NEC questions about or make comments on the proposed facility. Public comments are not evidence in the legal sense, but comments from members of the local community are an important source of background information for the siting board in reviewing a proposed energy facility and its potential impacts. There is a court reporter here who will transcribe the entire public hearing as I mentioned before we went on the record, in addition to the handouts that have been translated into Spanish, there are Spanish interpreters here tonight for those who may wish to offer comment or ask questions of NEC in Spanish. <coughs> and I would um, just like to let you know that if there is anyone who would like uh, translation assistance from the interpreters, you can feel free to get up and, and go to them at any time during tonight's proceeding. Before turning to the company's presentation, I would like to provide a very brief history of this proceeding. Then I will outline the legal standards that will govern the siting board's review of the proposed NEC facility, the process by which the board will review the facility, and how persons interested in further formal participation in this proceeding after tonight's hearing, um, how, how those persons could get more involved. As many of you are aware, tonight's public comment hearing is the second public comment hearing conducted by the Siting Board regarding NEC's proposal uh, to construct the LNG, excuse me, LNG facility. The Siting Board conducted its first public hearing on November 13th, 2018 at Charlton Town Hall. After that public hearing on December, in, in December of 2018, NEC informed the Siting Board that it would be revising its proposal for the facility. The Siting Board determined that the differences between the proposal presented by NEC in its original petitions and the company's planned revisions to that proposal were significant enough to warrant the filing of a new petition and holding a second public comment hearing. As the Siting Board has indicated in previous communications, this second public comment hearing also includes a second opportunity for the filing of petitions to intervene 
and petitions to participate in the proceeding. And I will address that a little more specifically in, in just a couple of moments. That's primarily aimed at informing those who have already filed petitions to intervene in the proceeding that they don't need to redo their petition. They don't need to file a second time. If, however, those who have already filed petitions wish to update their petitions, uh, perhaps in response to some of the changes in the project, um, everyone who has already filed is welcome to file again. And you would just indicate on your petition that it is a supplement to your previous petition. All right, so on February 23rd of this year, NEC filed with the Siting Board an amended petition to construct the LNG facility. NEC then submitted an amended zoning petition on April 19th, 2019. The most significant differences between the original NEC petitions filed in August 2018 and the amended petitions filed in February and April 2019 is that NEC now proposes to construct the LNG facility on a different site in Charlton. Originally, NEC's preferred site for the facility was at 249 Sturbridge Road or Route 20 uh, in Charlton. NEC refers to this site as the Route 20 site. Now, NEC's pr preferred site for the LNG facility is at 304 Southbridge Street, which NEC refers to as the Route 169 site. Additionally, NEC has proposed two alternative sites for the facility. The Route 20 site, which was the original preferred site, is now one of two alternative sites being proposed. The third site is located west of Sherwood Lane and south of the Millennium Power Plant facility. NEC refers to this site as the Sherwood Lane site. NEC is also proposing a number of pipeline, gas pipeline alternatives to connect its proposed facility to the existing Tennessee gas pipeline for its gas supply. Finally, the design for the facility's on-site LNG storage facility has been significantly revised. On-site storage in a 2 million gallon above ground tank is the current proposal. NEC seeks approval to construct the LNG facility under General Laws, Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 164, Section 69J. Under this provision, the Siting Board will determine whether the facility would provide a reliable energy supply for the Commonwealth with a minimum impact on the environment at the lowest possible cost. <coughs> The company also seeks approval pursuant to General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 3, for the individual zoning exemptions and the comprehensive zoning exemption that I mentioned earlier. <coughs> to receive approval for the company's requested zoning exemptions, NEC will need to demonstrate, among other things, that the proposed project is reasonably necessary for the convenience and welfare of the public. Now, just a, a few words about uh, what the Siting Board is and, and how our process works. The Siting Board itself is a nine-member state board appointed by the governor to review proposals to construct large-scale new and expanded energy facilities in Massachusetts. Tonight's public comment hearing constitutes the very beginning of the Siting Board's review of NEC's proposed LNG facility. Over the course of the next several months, the Siting Board will require the company to provide additional information 
beyond what is contained in its petitions regarding the proposal. After completion of this information gathering process, referred to as discovery, the Siting Board will conduct evidentiary hearings in Boston. During evidentiary hearings, NEC will present witnesses to testify regarding all aspects of the proposed facility, including the need for, the reliability of, the environmental impacts of, and the cost of the facility. The Siting Board and any other parties to this case have the opportunity to examine the company's witnesses live under oath and to ask the company to provide any additional information necessary to adequately review the company's proposal. The Siting Board will make a decision on the company's petitions after the discovery process has been completed and evidentiary hearings have been completed. There are three different ways that a member of the public may get involved in this case. Each of these involves a different level of participation. The first way is to provide oral comments tonight on the record, which the Siting Board staff will take into consideration and follow up on where appropriate during the evidentiary hearing process. Alternatively, you may submit written comments addressing any aspect of the project to the Siting Board, which a number of you have already done. You, may, you could submit your written comments tonight or at any time after tonight while the proceeding is, is on the <coughs> I will note that um, comments are most helpful to staff if they're submitted uh, within, say, the next two weeks. The second way to get involved. This one, sorry, but when you say comment can be submitted, it said till June 12th. That's right. There's no way to extend that for 14. You would, um, that's right, uh, I'm gonna get to the June 12th deadline, but, and you're right. Um, this is a second continuing town meeting, so this could be something important, you could discuss at that meeting, so you're cutting, you're cutting them off. I just wanna let you know that. No, I, I appreciate that information. What, what day is the um, town meeting? The 13th. The 13th. What I would ask, um, and, and I'm, I'm hoping this won't be asking too much of you, if you could email me and put that request in writing, I will consider that to be a motion to extend the comment period beyond June 12th. And maybe you could propose a date that you think would, would work for everyone. Okay, you're quite welcome. Okay, uh, the second way to get involved in this case would be to formally request in writing to become an intervener in the proceeding. An intervener is a full party to the case and may participate actively in the proceeding. To become an intervener, you must demonstrate in your written request how you, in particular, may be, quote, substantially and specifically affected by the proposed project. If you are granted intervener status, you become a full party and you receive an, uh, a number of rights. Those include the right to request information uh, from the company and from other parties to offer evidence, to present witnesses during evidentiary hearings, to cross-examine all other parties' witnesses, and to submit a brief at the conclusion of the proceeding. Ultimately, it is only interveners, full parties, who have the ability to appeal the Siting Board's final decision um, if that's something that uh, uh, someone wants to do. The third way, um, the final way I'm going to talk about here tonight to get involved would be slightly less active than being a full party, an intervener. 
And that would be to become what we call a limited participant. A, as the name implies, a limited participant's role is more limited than that of an intervener. As a limited participant, you would receive a copy of all documents that are produced and filed during the proceeding, and you may submit a brief to the citing board at the end of evidentiary hearings, in which you could set out your position regarding how the case should be decided. However, as a limited participant, you will not be able to put on evidence or call your own witnesses and you won't have the right to cross-examine other parties' witnesses or to appeal the final decision. If you decide that you would like to submit a petition requesting intervener or limited participant status, there are specific rules concerning deadlines and the information that must be included in your petition. Copies of the Citing Board Rules for intervening or participating are available, again, on that table right outside the door to the auditorium. There also is some additional information, both in the formal notice for tonight's proceeding um, and in the Citing Board Handbook. There's a section about how do I intervene in a Citing Board proceeding. Turning to the June 12th um, deadline. Right now, we have a June 12th deadline for filing of petitions to intervene or petitions for limited participant status. Um, that's uh, our customary period that is two weeks after tonight's public hearing. Um, but I want to note for the record, um, that we have received this evening a request to extend that deadline by a few days, is my understanding, to allow for town meeting on June 13th. And do you mind um, just uh, providing your name for the record? So I, pardon? Okay, Ms. Julie Down has made that request and, oh, Down. Um, and we'll be uh, sending staff uh, an email requesting that extension in writing. A couple other te technicalities and then we'll be on to NEC's presentation. If you do file a petition to intervene or to participate as a limited participant, You need to file your petition with the citing board, that can be done electronically, and you also need to file a copy of your petition with counsel for NAC, Mr. James Avery, who I think will be introducing himself um, shortly. The addresses for the citing board, including email addresses for both citing board and for Mr. Avery, are set forth in the public notice of tonight's hearing. Okay, and there's just the last thing, I'll, I'll repeat myself uh, once more. If you have already filed a petition to intervene, you need not file a new one unless you have some reason for wanting to file a new or supplemental petition. All right, at this time, I invite NEC to present its project. Immediately after that, I will explain the procedures that we will follow for taking comments and questions from the audience. And we will hear from those of you uh, who wish to speak tonight. I would ask uh, counsel for NEC to identify himself for the record. My name is James Avery. I'm with the law firm of uh, Pierce Atwood in our Boston office, and I'm representing NEC before the site of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Avery. Which reminds me, the way we have set things up tonight is that NEC will be 
responding to questions and comments using that microphone where Mr. Pedri is standing right now. We will be asking members of the audience who wish to speak to come up to the microphone there on my left, on your right. Uh, that makes it best for the um, court reporter to make sure that we're getting everything down for the transcript. Mr. Avery, I would ask if you would like at this time to present someone from the company to make a presentation on behalf of the company. Yes, thank you very much. Just a, just a brief remark. I thank you for the procedural summary. It is a bit confusing to cite board practice having a preferred and then must present alternative locations. Uh, NEC had, uh, appreciates everyone's participation here and tonight. Part of the reason uh, that it was a change in the preferred site, uh, some of it was contemplated at the time of the filing last summer, but some of the comments that were received in the initial public comment hearing were considered and evaluated and weighed in on that decision. So we appreciate uh, the site and board agreeing to hold another public comment hearing so there'd be another opportunity for folks in town and in some of the neighboring towns to, to speak and comment on, on the proposal. Okay, thank um, you, Mr. Avery. We have uh, Mr. Matthew Taylor will be up in a moment. He's from NEC. He will be providing the initial presentation. We also have uh, with him uh, Boris Bravnov, who was the primary speaker last time. Uh, these two gentlemen are with NEC. NEC uh, Liberty Energy Trust, which is the lead developer for the project. We have uh, an environmental consultant, AJ Blunt, Jeff Lanowski, I, I probably butcher that, AJ, I apologize. He's doing all the environmental analysis with his firm, Epsilon. And we also have Jade Gamble, from Weston Sampson, who's been the company engineer and managing a lot of the engineering analysis. There's a whole host of other engineers affiliated with particular components of the project that are here. Uh, we'll be pleased to try to respond to your questions and comments, but if you're more comfortable at the end of the evening uh, and you would like to approach any of us, some people don't like coming up to the microphone, we'll stick around for a little bit and we'll be happy to try to address your questions, comments, or concerns. So thank you again for participating and I'll turn it over to Mr. Taylor. Good evening. Is this loud enough for everyone in the back? Yes. Okay, keep that. Uh, good evening, Town Examiner, members of the EFSB, uh, members of the Town uh, Board of Selectmen, uh, neighbors for the, uh, the project. Uh, thank you very much for coming here this evening. Uh, my name is Matt Taylor, as Jim mentioned. I am a, a partner with the Northeast Energy Center. We are developing uh, this project here in, in Charlton. And um, I work with our, our firm on a number of energy projects, both in the US and abroad, developing both energy, LNG, and other uh, infrastructure projects in the uh, related area. So I'm originally from Boston. I work out of our Philadelphia headquarters, but I'm excited to be back in Massachusetts uh, working with this project. I'll be describing the enhancements we made to our proposed LNG facility in Charlton. Uh, as was mentioned when we did the uh, full proposal last summer, we've had an opportunity to do additional engineering and environmental assessments. Um, and as a result of that, we changed our primary preferred site location, as was mentioned from the Route 20 location uh, to the Route 169 location. And we changed the tank design uh, as a result of this facility. Those are really the only two substantive changes from the proposal that we went through last summer and our public comment hearing in November. But we have, as we mentioned, a number of the engineering experts in the room who can walk through some of the details that led to those uh, changes from our initial plan and can address any other questions you may have. Um, as, you, as you heard, when we filed a petition with the, energy, uh, with the Commonwealth's Principal Energy Agency last summer, we had to identify uh, alternative sites in addition to preferred sites. And that discussion had led to us identifying the Route 20 site as our preferred location. And we had identified sites on 169 as a potential alternative site. Um, our initial position really has uh, not changed very much from the underlying engineering, but the locations have some different flavors, some different pros, different cons. A lot of that did come from feedback we heard from neighbors and other engineers. 
And um, you know, we had indicated at the time in November that we were looking at this 169 site very seriously and wanted to uh, get more information about that. And obviously, for us being located near the Millennium Power Plant has some interesting synergies. It's an industrial park of Charlton, and it is at a nexus of a number of energy corridors within the, within the uh, uh, town of Charlton, sitting on the gas transmission as well as the electric transmission lines in the Commonwealth. Um, we are going to continue to have conversations with neighbors, with uh, members of the business community, township, uh, government officials, selectmen, anyone who uh, we can reach out to and, and show the plans in some more detail to get some more uh, comfort with this facility as this, uh, as this goes through the development, permitting, construction, and eventually the operation of the facility as well. And uh, that's an important part of this public hearing here tonight and something we want to continue going forward. But as I mentioned, these additional analyses and consultant reports and uh, engineering analysis really left us with the preferred location moving away from Route 20 to the Route 169 location. Uh, Route 20 uh, has a number of environmentally sensitive areas, wetlands around the location. Uh, Route 20 obviously has some traffic challenges. Uh, there was an accident here on the way over tonight. I don't know if any of you had to fight through that, but uh, we, we are aware of some of those issues on the Route 20 side. Um, so we had two site locations within 169, as was mentioned. We have our preferred location right near Incom, uh, right on 169. And then we have the alternative uh, site on 169 called, uh, we call Sherwood Lane, just a little bit further north, closer to the Millennium Power Plant. Um, and these two sites have different flavors, different pros, different cons, but it is where we have identified um, both our primary and a potential alternative site. And as mentioned, we are retaining the Route 20 as a potential alternative site as we continue this process uh, with the state. Um, a couple other things to mention. Um, we are also going to be uh, connecting the gas pipeline from the interstate pipeline that already goes through Charlton to our site. And you'll see in our filing, we have a couple different routes we can locate that pipeline. Obviously, with the Millennium Power Plant, they already have an interconnection to the interstate pipeline to provide natural gas to their uh, generating facility. And you'll see uh, a number of short interconnection pipelines that we propose to connect our facility to the gas pipeline. As Jim mentioned, we have a number of uh, engineering experts here who will be available uh, both during questions and as well afterwards uh, to answer any specific questions people have and can share. We've built a number of facilities that are similar to this and uh, the teams uh, have uh, developed a lot of different projects and addressed a number of different environmental and site location challenges. So I think we have a good background collectively in this room to address uh, a number of questions any, any neighbors uh, may have about this facility. Um, I would like to mention though first, why are we proposing this facility? As was mentioned, you know, there is a state process to prove need and, and prove the uh, benefit for the ratepayers of Massachusetts, but the immediate benefit here is the ability to boost the reliability and cost savings for gas consumers in Massachusetts. Uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities has looked at this uh, during the polar vortex a couple of years ago. Gas supplies in Massachusetts become very tight. And when that happens, there's a cascading event that uh, gas customers are shed from the demand. Uh, and some of that impacts uh, electric generators. You know, Millennium Power Station has to keep a oil backup a site on uh, that convert oil. And during the polar vortex, a lot of gas plants in Massachusetts had to switch from natural gas to oil and diesel. And depending how long these polar vortex last, there's a true threat to reliability to the electric grid if those facilities are not able to get um, back on the grid, back on natural gas, or back on a uh, replacement supply of oil and diesel. So we also believe this facility will eventually uh, will provide benefits to customers, not just in Eastern Mass, but also in central and western mass. Uh, right now, uh, a lot of LNG that comes from, uh, is coming from the Everett Station in Boston. To the extent that that facility is dependent on overseas natural gas coming from whether Yemen or Russia or other foreign providers, there's a reliability issue that those countries may or may not provide natural gas when Massachusetts needs it. The natural gas that we produce domestically here at the site and store for uh, winter use will be available uh, through National Grid, through other potential utilities in the state. And potentially over longer periods of time, 
may be a fueling option for other communities within uh, Worcester County and Central Mass. Um, and so I, I mentioned the Millennium Power Station being there. That is a key synergy we see in the site. Uh, as many of you can see with the site, that is a significant, a large electric generating facility that's been in operation in Charleston for several decades. They are dependent on natural gas coming off the same pipeline that we're going to tap into. And we want to be able to serve, help serve them uh, in their need to provide electricity to the Commonwealth, as well as serving our needs to uh, uh, provide customer uh, reliability for national grid. Um, longer term, we really do see LNG as a fuel that can displace oil and diesel. Oil and diesel are far dirtier when burned than uh, natural gas. And there's a lot of industrial applications, especially in New England, that are still running on oil and diesel that you don't see in Europe, Canada, Asia, and other countries. And we believe LNG eventually will be displacing bunker fuel for maritime transport. We believe the rails, which run 100% on diesel oil in the US, will eventually switch over to an LNG solution. And even long distance heavy trucking in Canada is starting to take off for LNG, where you get both the environmental benefits of fewer carbon uh, CO2 emissions, as well as nitrous oxide and uh, particulate uh, emissions from those fuel sources. And it also is a lower cost domestically sourced fuel relative to overseas imported uh, oil and distillates. Um, finally, uh, we are going through the siting boards process. It's a very rigorous one, as any of you who've seen our material that we've published uh, can, can vouch for. Uh, we looked with our utility partner, National Grid, for facility siting options throughout southern New England, uh, everywhere from southern New Hampshire uh, down to, uh, uh, to, to the Connecticut border. And this site location really had a number of things going for it. You already have a high, a high pressure gas transmission line going through the middle of town. There is an electric transmission infrastructure already existing in, in place. And we believe the uh, industrial zone locations at uh, Route 169 uh, are an appropriate location uh, adjacent to the Millennium Power Plant to provide this service and uh, do so with a minimal impact to the, the local environment. And as I mentioned, the Route, 120, uh, Route 20 site did have wetlands, which we are very sensitive to, to uh, have any disturbance to. The 169 site, very minimal uh, concerns with regard to that. Um, as we're working with Epsilon and um, our other environmental consultants, there's a few other things we're we'll doing to mitigate environmental impact of construction. We'll be using ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel and trying to do best processes to ensure that we have as minimal impact on the environment in Charlton as we're doing the construction process uh, and, and the environmental <coughs> of the facility itself. It's something to keep in mind uh, that on the coldest days in New England, about 40% of the natural gas that they use is provided by LNG. There is not enough pipeline capacity to meet demand on the very coldest days in New England. And so already, National Grid has its storage facilities that it builds up over the winter to provide uh, gas on the very coldest days where people are heating their homes, electric generation is occurring at higher levels. And those facilities are traditionally supplied by every terminal with imported LNG from overseas. Um, what's happened is a lot of the LNG is now, the fuel's being switched overseas. Boston, New England has to compete with China, South Korea, Japan to provide LNG, and that is not as cost effective as providing liquefied natural gas that we be taking off the interstate pipeline. No different than uh, cars coming off the mass pipe. We will take gas off the interstate pipeline on days when there's not a constraint, there's not a traffic jam on the pipeline. We will liquefy that, which just means putting it in a very efficient appliance, uh, kind of like a refrigerated cold box, where we will take the temperature of the gas off the pipeline to negative 260 degrees approximately, where it turns to a liquid. And we can store that at about 600 times the volume of uh, traditional gas. Then in a liquid form, we can store that in the tank, and then truck that to National Grid's uh, storage locations throughout the uh, greater Boston and uh, central Massachusetts areas. Um, Specifics on the route, routes, like roads, okay? Um, so we, we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. I mean, obviously, uh, we are supplying National Grid's uh, uh, storage locations, and that's, uh, that, that information 
is public where they store. Most of them are in, in Metro Boston, but there's a few other locations in out, outside of the greater Boston area. Uh, most of those trucks will be going up to the Mass Pike, up to Route 20, and connecting over um, over to the to generally go east. Although there are some sites that will be more north towards uh, uh, Worcester and West. So we'll have uh, we can provide with more detail uh, after that. Finally, uh, there was some. Two million gallons, a lot of times when we deal with energy, it's hard to get a sense of what, what is a two million gallon tank. And one of the things uh, to sort of point to is if you've seen the Millennium Power Plant, you've seen about a 1.4 million gallon tank of diesel. That's sitting there at the site today. It's been sitting there for 20 years. Ours is going to be a little bit bigger than that, but it's uh, effectively a large thermos. It's a double-lined uh, thermos where the liquefied natural gas at the very cold level so is a stainless steel container tank and it's surrounded by a hard, uh, thick concrete tank outside of it, which is large enough to contain any potential uh, uh, spills of the internal, internal thermos tank. Uh, it's relatively simple. There's not a lot of equipment that is used to keep that in place. Um, and all of our designs will meet or exceed both federal and Massachusetts standards for design and operation of that uh, facility. For us, uh, the larger tank provides a little bit more flexibility. We have proposed using 10 what we call bullet tanks, 10 100,000 gallon tanks at uh, the Route 20 site. Here we're using a single 2 million gallon tank um, that we will have some renderings to show you. It's, it's uh, not very visible from 169. Uh, there's a slight grade, but we are well below where the solar field is off of 169. And there's a fair amount of tree coverage on that site as well. Um, <laughs> So that is sort of where the facility is today. Um, what we believe, though, is this is still the start of the process. We are actively engaged with members of the community, the planning board, uh, broader state representatives. And we want to keep that dialogue going, not just today, not just through the planning process, but through construction and operation of this facility. And uh, tonight's that first uh, step in continuing that process. We, Thank you for your attention, and uh, we look forward to any comments and suggestions. And I, I really want to emphasize that it's not just answering questions, but we do look for, listen, and respond to questions and, and comments. And ideally, we want to be the best neighbors we can be in Charlton or any other location to do business. And we will take any sort of reasonable steps we can do to address any questions or concerns that you or your elected officials bring up in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. At this, uh, at this time, we will turn to the public comment and question portion of tonight's hearing. I would like to describe briefly the procedures we'll be using tonight. I first will call on any federal, state, or local officials who may be present, followed by members of the public in the order that they have signed the speakers list which again is located on that table just outside the door to the auditorium. If you have not had a chance to sign the speaker sheet and would like to speak, you may sign now um, or at any time during the hearing tonight. We would ask that when you're called on to speak, again, that you come up to this microphone to my left and that you state and spell your name for the court reporter and state your address. Are there any federal, state, or local officials here tonight who wish to make comments or members of their staff? Hearing none. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sanborn. I'll spell that for you. J O N T T H A N S A N B O R N. My address is 12 Jennings Road in Charlton and I am a member of the Charlton Board of Health. So tonight, um, there was some talk about how the facility is in contacting um, some of the town boards and officials, but 
to the best of my knowledge, I don't think we have gotten any real official um, communication about, uh, about the facility. That's the first point. Um, I had some questions, but I think I'll start off with um, some traffic safety concerns just to bring these up. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a traffic engineer that's involved with this. I would assume there is at some point, but I'll just bring up a few points here. I won't take up too much time. First of all, last year, um, according to uh, the Telegram Gazette, there was a story in the Telegram Gazette regarding traffic accidents in Charlton. Over the past five years, uh, there was a 57% increase in traffic accidents within the town. Furthermore, um, Officer McGrath was here tonight, who was part of the uh, Civilian Traffic Commission that did the study, um, said that the Route 20 intersection at Route 169 has been identified as the location where the most major accidents and injuries occur. Okay. Um, and actually, I can, I can provide, I've got some copies here if you'd like. I can <coughs> So that would be great. Okay, I'll make it handle this over a minute. Um, secondly, I talked with a uh, state police accident reconstruction specialist, and uh, he has done some accident uh, fatals and near fatals. They get called out for these, and he told me that his uh, his big issue is Route 20 now. As most of the people here in town recall, about 15 years ago, November of 2004, 3.65 miles of Route 20 was redone from um, uh, the, the center of town and, and going towards the Oxford line. And that has helped tremendously in, in reducing accidents. However, the other parts of town heading towards Sturbridge or Oxford have not changed. And according to the accident reconstruction person from the state police, the state standard lane width is 15 feet, okay, for state highways. The minimum is supposed to be 12 feet. And yet, if you go on Route 20 out west towards Sturbridge, there are sections of that where the lane widths are as little as 9 feet. Rather concerning, especially since between those four lanes of opposing traffic, there's about a foot of rumble strips. There's no breakdown lane, there's no shoulder, there's just a car rail, just to throw you back into the traffic. So then I started thinking, well, geez, how wide are these tractor trailers? And, and again, I have copies of this. This is from a transportation website that says that the uh, width of an average trailer is generally 102 inches or eight and a half feet wide. So you've got, if, you're, if they're going down the middle of that lane, it's nine feet wide, they've got about three inches on either side of the trailer before they're out of the lane. So I, I just hope that they would take this into consideration. I know that there's uh, other issues, so I'll, I'll let people speak to that. Um, in the meantime, I will hand over three copies of each from what I just presented to you, if I could. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sanders. this meeting um, from a friend of mine who was on the uh, Southbridge Town Council and who was very surprised that the Board of Health had not been notified or contacted in any way. And um, I went to your website and there's a whole list of town departments that have been contacted and that you've been in touch with, which I think is excellent. I just I'm a little bit uneasy about the fact that the Board of Health has not been contacted and it, perhaps there's no health issues to be dealt with, but I kind of doubt that. So 
I would like to um, I would like to express my concern about that. I would also like to ask to become a um, a uh, limited participant, and I would also like to invite uh, somebody from uh, the company to come to our next board meeting, which is on June 11th, and um, discuss with the full board uh, some of the concerns that the other members may also have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Walker. And I'm going to assume the company will meet with Ms. Walker if she's able to stay through the end of the period to discuss the June 11th, the possible June 11th. Rob, oh, sorry. No, it's my fault. No, when fine. I have my glasses on, I can't see distance. So. You don't want to see me, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Please, uh, go ahead. It's Bill, uh, B I L F B I L L Borowski, B O R O W S K I, 69 Haggerty, H A G G E R T Y Road. I'm a member of the Board of Selectmen. And let me say, before I get in trouble with my colleagues, I'm not speaking on behalf of them tonight. Um, question, first of all, I want to thank the group because I think your outreach to the Board of Selectmen uh, has been great so far. During our last meeting, you presented to us one of the questions that uh, I raised, and again, I think for the benefit of the group, if we could elaborate a little bit more, is after speaking to a lot of constituents and just residents, that there's a concern around the request for the zoning variances going outside of the Zoning Board of Appeals, and I was hoping that members uh, of the organization could speak to that for this crowd a little bit more. I mean, again, I think there's an understanding around there's a certain state expertise. However, I think it's difficult to justify to many people who would need to go in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals if they want to put a shed uh, 14 feet from their um, property line, and they would have to do that. Whereas an enormous facility can bypass our local board altogether and petition the state for something that is wildly out of our zoning. So again, I'd appreciate it if at some point this evening, if, if members uh, from the from the applicant's team could address that once again for the larger crowd. Thank you. Mr. Avery, would the company like to address um, that question now or? Whatever your preference would be. Okay. Um, let's take care of it now and then we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, I've permitted a lot of facilities uh, and zoning bylaws tend not to fit real squarely with a lot of energy facilities and often are inconsistent with some of the design and safety codes that are, that are there. There's a number of things that just aren't permissible. One of the things, for example, is, is a requirement that a, a gas tank be underground within your, your zoning bylaw. By design, by code, it needs to be above ground. So there's a, there's at least a couple of real uh, sort of stymies that would, if we were to comply with the zoning bylaw, would not be as safe as those standards would be. So it's it's rather common practice to go ask for these zoning exemptions. But I think one of the things that we've attempted to do and agreed to do uh, is to uh, because we can't get a, a if you will, a, a solid approval from the zoning uh, officials that would enable the company to build the facility in a safe, compliant manner, to go through the same process informally and, and sit down with the zoning officials in the town. And if there are conditions, we will agree to those that might be put in an order, just like the people you mentioned that would have to go in for the shed. We'll do that informally, but there's a couple areas that there's just this inconsistency, which is why we bring it to the state experts to make sure that we design it safely and consistently. So we try to be respectful of the interests of the town, but also recognize that the experts at the site board will be the ones that really have to decide on the design that we propose to make sure it's consistent with requirements and various regulations. I hope that addresses your, your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avery. Robert Kuchalski. Good 
the record, my name is Frank Lombardi. I'm the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, it's all on the ARPI, just like the coach. Um, <coughs> losing my voice a little bit. Uh, just for the record, uh, the company did reach out to the Zoning Board of Appeals about two weeks ago for uh, an informal meeting with the chair. At, at that time, the board, I am speaking on behalf of the board, by the way, the board has authorized me in open meeting to speak tonight. Um, the board decided that uh, at that time, uh, they didn't necessarily see a benefit. I guess the board was looking for more uh, of some sort of meeting uh, with the entire board in an open meeting forum. Uh, I don't think at this time the board is necessarily opposed to the, the project, uh, but we can't necessarily make any sort of zoning determination because they haven't really seen us in, in any manner as of yet. So hopefully council will uh, contact uh, and, and set something up through our secretary for some sort of meeting. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lombardi. Mm -hmm. My point is on the list as well, so. Oh, okay. I don't, And I know um, for the record that the Zoning Board of Appeals has filed a petition to intervene in the proceeding. Jay or Mary Beth Saja. <coughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. Robert, please come up to the microphone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Pachalski. P U C H A L S K I. My office is located at 318 South Patrol in Charleston. And just a couple of quick, easy, simple questions, I guess. It's, uh, number one, I'm concerned, or not concerned, but I'd like to know what the hours of operation would be in this facility. Number one, secondly, the uh, <coughs> noise pollution that it's going to create and uh, how long it's going to take to construct the facility, when it'll come online from the date of, of, uh, of construction. Uh, and, I, and if there's going to be any, uh, any odors that are going to be emitted from the operation that the area that the community is going to be impacted by? And if so, how are they going to be treated? How it can be handled? Thank you very much, Mr. Puchowski. Um, does the company want to address Mr. Puchowski's four points at this time? Yes, please. Okay. If I could turn to Mr. Bruno. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Like most of energy facilities, this facility will be broken when you yeah. 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 Is it better? Yes. Yeah. Like any energy facility, uh, this facility will be running 24 hours a day. And uh, most of the time it will be given uh, availability of gas, so it will be more time of the year. Relative to noise from the facility, Massachusetts State uh, Commonwealth have very strict protocols. So what we've been doing, and that's why we've taken uh, extra time, additional time during summer time and during winter time, we have to approve the protocol and to install noise detectors. Uh, these noise detectors will register ambient noise at any point of sensitive receptors. It's a closest. Uh, residence, closes, office, any of these facilities. Then we have to design a facility that effectively noise from our facility will be non audible. So the difference would be 3, 4, 5 decibel uh, relative to these receptors. So they would have to be below <coughs> the noise. So in some cases, we will be using certain silencers, in some cases, fans 
uh, would uh, slow down penetration in some cases equipment would be placed in the building. So the idea would be to make facility somewhat literally non-audible. Uh, it would not emit any doors, so it would be uh, impossible to recognize from this point of view. And, uh, and as discussed, we will continue to stay in touch, we will continue to take advice, and uh, we will continue to inform and to learn uh, from the community and from the audience what is the best way and how to help the neighbor. Construction schedule? Construction schedule is a little bit hard to predict because of Massachusetts winter. Uh, so if copyright, it's probably around uh, when all equipment is ordered, it's probably about one summer long construction cycle. Depends when you start construction cycle. Depends how quickly the winter is coming. We, if we receive the approval, we start the process. Uh, most likely it will take summer and most likely it will be commissioned next spring. So most of the equipment is uh, skid waste, so it's prefabricated, it's pre manufactured. So when it arrives uh, on site, it will be assembled, directed, interconnected, and commissioned into operations. So most parts of the equipment, all parts of the equipment are standard. They've been around Massachusetts for half a century. Obviously, environmental controls, safety controls have been improved. But nitrogen double expander is, for example, in Springfield, has been working for the last almost 50 years. Hours of operation? Is this going to be 24 hours? 24 hours. So that means traffic trucking 24 hours? Ah, relative to trucks, so under the agreement to supply to seasonal LNG facilities over 24 hours cycle, there will be around 12, 14 trucks coming in, uh, to this facility. Most of them will be coming during regular day hours. So it will be unusual to have a night market consumer. Um, maybe following up quickly because it's related, if I can. Sure. Related Please traffic go. question. So, yes, uh, we looked into audit, uh, safety audit of intersection 169 and 20. So we plan to work accordingly uh, with this audit. And yes, we require to submit a traffic study related to this. Overall number of trucks I mean, is, in every part on the road is significant, obviously, but general 12, 14 trucks a day should be an overwhelming relative to local road. Thank you. Now back to Jay and Mary Beth Sasha. Mary Beth Saja, and that is C-Z-A-J-A. -A. We are at 278 Southbridge Road in Charlton. Our business is North American Tool and Machine Corporation. And we're the little L-shaped piece of property right below the Sherwood Lane, or Sherwood Road um, property. I have a list of questions, and I know the Bruins are on tonight, so we all might want to do something else. Um, but my first question, I was actually hoping, I appreciate the town officials that are here tonight. I was hoping that there would be more town officials because I'm not sure some of my questions are really for the town of Charlton or for your board or for our new friends here at NEC. Um, my first question is, I would like to know what type of, is there any tax incentive that the town of Charlton has offered this facility? On the airway. On the airway, okay. Uh, no. Nothing been offered. Okay. The next question would be. The next question would be, since thankfully you've done so many of these facilities, what has the history been on the effect of property value? It depends, because these facilities are located, as I mentioned, just in Commonwealth. They are located in Boston. They are located in Providence. They are located in Springfield. So, uh, in our case, what we hope 
as my discussed, that the facility will be actually helpful, good neighbor, because one of the logics is that facility effectively allows access to a pipeline, gas pipeline that are coming along, and we hope that not only facility will be taking the benefit of this pipeline, because right now town does not really benefit from this pipeline. You have high voltage transmission corridor, you have the pipeline, but you don't have benefits of this. In this case, Charlton will start to benefit from this supply of gas, and we believe that Charlton uh, commercialized and first just easy to serve, will start to see benefits of natural gas. If just one of the reference related to Massachusetts uh, energy website, the difference by heating your house with gas relative to heating your house with electricity is $3,500. So you tell me how big difference in the budget of a regular child and family annual $3,500 is. Does it increase value of the house if you heat it by clean a few, which is less expensive, or does it diminish the value of the house? So we hope that it will be not just synergies with the bigger facilities, but synergies with commercial facilities. And we hope that it will be a helpful neighbor, the town of Charlton. Do you know how many homes in the town of Charlton actually use natural gas to heat? Are they no, oil, electric, or natural gas? Mostly it will be oil, propane, or electric. Okay, so gas the conversion of that would be a cost. Okay, that, that wasn't on my list, so I was just curious. A lot, again, um, I know last time that you guys were out, you talked about the security of these facilities. Um, obviously, in the climate we live in, sitting on top of what was one million, and now two million gallons is a little concerning. I did notice an interesting fact, though, so I had notes from our last meeting, that you said 12 to 24 trucks a day with a one million gallon facility. I think it's interesting that that stayed about the same number for a two million gallon facility. Um, but again, talking about the security of the facility itself, um, it is, it is the town of Charlton pre prepared in the event that there is a situation happening at this facility? And just to put it in perspective, and that is a good question, and okay. safety is a high priority, and safety is an important aspect, and the multiple safety solutions related to these plants, and so far, all of these facilities in Boston, Providence, Springfield, they served Massachusetts for half a century in a very safe way. So we hope we'll continue this process, serving that place. And just to put it in perspective, 300, let's put it 400 feet away from this facility, you have an oil storage tank with 1.3 million gallons, energy density of 1.3 million gallons of oil, and 2 million gallons of LNG is the same. So you have these facilities already in Charlton with the same or higher energy density. So in general, it does not, it does not make it more safe, less safe. Only in this case, usually you will have uh, around the oil tank, you don't really have to have a diet. You don't really have to have a concrete wall, totally unit. <coughs> you don't really have to have all other safety equipment. In this case, you do have additional safety equipment. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, again, coming back to the construction, if you were to be in the Sherwood, the Sherwood site, that is very ledge. That's a lot of ledge. Um, would there be blasting involved in the construction of this facility? So far, we designated the preferred site as 169. Your reference to Sherwood Lane is appropriate. It's an aging place. At 169, we are not planning to do blasting. So we plan that it would be just a mechanical work relative to But the I site. asked about Sherwood. Uh, Sherwood designated as no just alternative. So we frankly did not study uh, what type of site preparations would it require. And we did not do a geotech study. For 169, we did both. We did a geotech study, and we know where the ledge is, and we know that most likely it will not require blasting, and we also did seismic work. So it would it be safe to say since you didn't do any of that for Sherman, and you did do it for Route 20, 
and you did do it for 169, but you didn't do it for Sherwood, should that even be considered an alternate site for the purpose of this meeting? It would be because the view is the one. I would guess that's a question for the board. Why did that be, if they haven't done the homework on Sherwood, why is that being considered an alternative site? I'm just, I don't do this for a living, so I don't know. Well, let, let me answer as an applicant. In this case, so just different requirement of home York uh, is required for preferred and alternate site. And even for preferred site, Geotech at this stage. Can you speak up, please? Uh, even for preferred site, Geotech and seismic are not required. So we just wanted to be sure that we don't have any surprises. We wanted to be sure that we completed our home work as much as we can. And we wanted to be sure that we will have answers uh, relative to any questions on the preferred side. I appreciate that. Two reasons why I'm bringing that up. One, what feeds my family and my employees' families is the fact that we run a precision CNC machine shop. Blasting right behind our facility might be a little bit of a problem. Matter of fact, it would be a big one. Right. Secondly, probably a lot of the people in this room have already gone through an enormous water problem based on the groundwater in that area, thanks to another large corporation of Casal Waste Management. I don't think that the town of Charlton would like to see this, the water table messed with again with blasting in any particular area. Um, I'm not going to speak for the people here in Charlton, but I would say that, you know, having to shower with bottled water and use bottled oh, water for everything was probably really terrible. So, um, again, I think that there's a lot more research that has to go into that site. Well, we appreciate your comments and uh, we took them into account and that's why we're not really plan to have blasting and also facility will not be consuming water. Um, to the siting board, I appreciate all the environmental concerns that you have. I think that it's great working with conservation commissions. I'm not sure if the town of Charlton has a stormwater authority, but I'd be interested to know if there was a stormwater plan and erosion management plan. That also I'd be very interested to know. I'd also be interested, interested to know that when Millennium built their plan, there was a conservation restriction on land adjacent to their facility, and I'd be interested to know how this would affect that particular piece of property. <coughs> Aside from that, I think it's also important to take into consideration what happens with the people. You know, you can worry about the environment a lot, but we need to worry about the taxpayers as well. Again, going back to the property values, I haven't met any person that when we've said we're coming to this hearing tonight that says, yeah, I want to live right next to that. That sounds great. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of value here. You know, our business is very important to us. I'm sure these people's homes are very important to them. That, you know, when you take into consideration environmental stuff, which I, I sit on the stormwater board in West Brookfield, I've been on conservation commissions, I'm on the Lakewood Preservation Association. I'm very into the environment, however, I think that the people here are very important too. And I think there's a lot of things that need to be addressed with um, property values. Uh, moving on to, who owns the three sites now? Or do you have to, you have to try to purchase those? When, uh, we have an option agreement related to preferred site. And to answer your previous question, we are not going through the conservation one. And to my knowledge, uh, this land was contributed to conservation easements during the power plant construction and after construction. So it was part of um, part of an agreement uh, between the power plant project and the town. Because the, the, the connections, though, would have to go with conservation because they would run one potential one is like right along Katie Brook. So conservation would definitely have oversight on that. The Conservation Commission will have and we filed with the Conservation Commission and we did very extensive weapon delineation and easement study and you're exactly right, it's a careful spot and we'll try to maintain all the buffer zones related to interconnection lines and they will be not going through the conservation level. Okay. Regarding the connection, if you were at the 304 site and going down along 169 that was just paved, um, What's the, constru like the construction project on that? Because then you would be blocking two accesses to our facility, Incom's facility, um, the new little package store that's trying to make it again and again and again. Um, a lot of disruption there, so I was just curious to know what the, the plan would be for that. Uh, the plan is not to touch any pavements. 
related to 169. So we obviously are not an unpaved side of shoulder of 169. We have met and had discussions with DOT related to this, and it's obviously also their preference not to go for any payment. Our septic is going to be right there. Our septic isn't that far off in 169, so that doesn't make me feel great. Okay. Um, how many full-time employees will this facility employ? Um, usually when facility runs, it would it save us any gas plants they probably we will have most of the time about three people on site. Okay. The trucking companies, are they local? Are they employed by NEC? Or are they um, no, national not, grid? Mm -hmm. They are not employed by NEC, not owned by NEC. Uh, trucking company is local. Uh, trucking company is Transgas. Transgas is a Massachusetts company. They have been in this business for more than 50 years. And you definitely see their trucks, because right now they truck long routes, on route 20 and Maspike. They go in from Everett to Ludlow. They go in from Everett to Berkshire. They go into different places. So this is a union, a Transgas company. And as I mentioned, they've been in this business for half a decade. And they do have stellar safety record. How about the, the construction company? Will that be a local construction company as well? I mean, we have a few representatives from a construction company. It is a local company, okay. a bond, and they do construct a local commonwealth. They have enough experience. One of the latest projects they do in construction for MIT, and I'm sure the audience is asking even tougher questions at the moment. <coughs> and I'm sure that they do meet in pretty high technological standards. I would just like to see as many local people involved as possible. That was not supposed to be a trick. That's, uh, so far, I think I'm only the one who is not local, so that's why I'm speaking. Uh, the rest of participants are local, uh, Western Wisconsin is local, Massachusetts are working from a visitor office. Uh, AJ is local, that's along Massachusetts Associates. Bond is local, so Pierce Edward is local. So, so far, as I said, it's only me who is yeah, we, we kind of talk Trump jobs. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, uh, it is the key for us. We can only right? have one person speaking at a time. We do enjoy uh, preparation, but we also need to be sure that even locally we are finding the best expertise. Um, just one last thing about the, the trucking comments and all the accidents on Route 20. You know, we, we lived through Route 20 under construction. We lived through 169 under construction. And we lived through accidents in that area all the time. We lived through when accidents happen on the mass bike in that area gets backed up all the time. We've lived through the dump trucks going to Casella that lined 169 and we couldn't, our employees couldn't even get into the business in the morning. You know, we've lived through all that, but the concern is really the accidents and the safety. Will NEC be willing to help the town of Charlton um, upgrade perhaps some of their emergency management equipment? Um, or staffing. You know, I can give you an example. You know, sometimes when large companies like a Walmart goes in somewhere, all of a sudden the police force is overburdened. You know, um, that happened in the town of Leicester, for example. Is there anything, any consideration of that? We, we started the process and we opened two ideas and we do appreciate these comments and we are very serious about this one. So we engaged with all three emergency response groups uh, Charlton, Southbridge, Turbridge. And step one, so we will be sending them to the Massachusetts Academy, Emergency Response Academy, and if they will come back and say, in addition to this academy, we need this, we need that, we definitely will try to do our best to be sure that people are well trained and well equipped. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Sorry. <laughs> Kathleen Brill. Jane Fran me. There I I apologize, but there is a name after Jane who I cannot discuss.
The address is 19 Meadow Lane, and I believe the first name is Greg. No comment. Thank you. <laughs> David Mark Fallon. I'm going to pass. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. just um, for the record um, speak your name and, and who you represent. J. Gamble, G-A-M-B-L-E. I'm with Weston and Sampson, we're the owner's engineer for NEC. So the gas meter station proposed uh, off of, I'm assuming you're referencing one of the alternate routes off of Cochrane Hill Road? Yes. Yeah, so the gas meter station Roughly, it would be a 100 by 100 foot area with a building that would contain metering equipment that Kinder Morgan would use to meter the gas that would flow to the to the facility. Would, would this facility increase the operating time of the current compressor station to be 24-7, 365 days a year? No, it's not expected that, that, that the NEC facility would increase the operations of the current Kinder Morgan compressor station. And are you adding existing pipelines? Like, are you increasing the size of the pipelines that are going through the residential areas? No, just adding a pipeline that would feed gas to the facility. But we wouldn't be increasing the size of any of the existing Tennessee gas pipelines. Thank you. I just have one comment I could make, if that's possible. You have this ambient noise that you say you test for. I mean, I live right next to the Tennessee gas pipeline, and I was assured that that would not be very loud, but I can tell you it's extremely loud when you're living next to it, and it is very disruptive. So I'm not really sure when this facility is in for those neighbors that are living right there. It's a lot different than, than what we were left to believe. Thank you. Scott Jamaica? Jamaica. My name is Scott S C O T T Lamica L A M I C A. All right. I live on two fifty seven Southbridge Road. I have the biggest trophy I ever had before. I look at the power plant. And when that was built, they told me that they put awnings on my house. Sure, no problem. 3,500 bucks later, 10 years later, they disintegrated. No problem. Another $3,500 on top of that. That's what they promised me. Another thing, traffic. Does anybody have records? On how many accidents were on 169 this year? No, right? Another problem, noise. I live right next to LMP, the machine shop, and the, new, the power plant. We hear noise all the time. The steam let go. And others, the crane moving. We 
We don't complain about it. But now it's time. I got half a million dollar house. The value dropped because of the power plant. Another thing I didn't complain about. The power plant shoots their rifles and shoots their guns across the street. Does anybody know about that? No. Now what happens, they go hunting over on that other side. There's plenty of deer. What happens if somebody made a mistake and shot one of their tanks? Nothing said, right? Another thing, Route 20. They put the treehouse there. Not a bad thing, but they didn't plan it out good. Look at the traffic now. Who's eating it? Chow. There's other things that bother me. I planned living there for a long time. This is our dream house. If you want to come by and check it out, it's three and a half acres. Would you guys love to see that in your front window? Or if it blows up, what do I tell my daughter? Goodbye. Do we know when this is gonna explode? What kind of warning do we have? You people don't live there. Would you love to live next to one of these plants? If you do, I have a vacant apartment right next to it. Come and join me. Stay for a while. I got an in-ground pool, hot tub, everything. Nice three and a half acres with a brook running through it. That's all I got to say. I think you guys should do your homework. Thank you, Mr. Jamica. Lamica. John Kulowski. John Kulowski, J O H N P U L D W S K I. I live at 87 Old North Woodstock Road in Southbridge. I don't live in Charlton. I don't know, we have the same state representative, but I don't see him here. I'm disappointed about that, because you're a state uh, board, correct? I, uh, but my primary question when I signed, I was curious how many trucks would be coming. I, it's my understanding, looking at similar size facilities, that they produce about a quarter million gallons a day, or, or approximately, so that seems consistent with the figure given by these gentlemen. But your town has taken a lot over the years. The gas uh, spills from the turnpike gas station, the horrendous situation that many of us are rather certain comes from the landfill that was approved. Something that I feel badly about, although the town approved it, I felt that the state failed to do its job. When you have a small community that handled enough waste, I know this isn't a waste issue, but we handled the waste of, uh, well, 95% of the waste that went there was from out of our town. It was really beyond the capacity of our or health to manage it. So the state kind of intervenes <laughs> in that it allows things to go to small towns. And the small towns often don't have the resources to uh, be able to have proper oversight. And when you call the DEP or the Mass Environmental Police, they're often reluctant to act until 
something bad happens. Then they show up. And, and that's my primary concern, even though I, if I applied to be an intervener, I'd probably be turned down because I live probably four miles, or at least three miles from the site. But I'm concerned that these little towns get bullied by corporations. These men seem like polite people that are answering questions. But beware, some people are concerned about reduced property values. My concern, like in Southbridge, we were told we're gonna have 600 jobs at the industrial park, and right now I don't think we have six jobs on the industrial park. We're, the promises get made, money, well, what if you're told you're going to make a lot of money because of the tax sale? Even then, I just want to remind people that when a community or town government accepts large amounts of money, there's some things that can't be replaced by money. You can't, if those people uh, north of the landfill, the, I mean 99 homes that have contaminated wells, yeah, they're bringing in water, but they're still right now washing in these chemicals that can permeate the skin. I don't really know about the environmental and health problems related to CNG. I appreciate that CNG is cleaner than other forms of fuel, but I, I, I just hope that the state, you folks, appreciate your responsibility. And remember that when you deal with towns that only have a population, let's say under 20,000 people, that they don't have the resources. And so please keep that in mind, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Polowski. Dan Butler? Catherine, if I may, uh, I think we skipped the first two people on the list, Joe Lewandowski and Mr. Jalbert. All right, let me just check. Well, I write to Mr. Bukowski at the beginning. I'm sorry, what, what were the names again? Mr. Lewandowski, Joe Lewandowski. I called that name. No, no. I'm sorry. All right, and what is the second name that is? Ed Jalbert. Second on the list. Yes, I, I, I do see that. Um, and I have both of them checked off, but obviously that was an error on my part. Um, why don't we then take the two of you now? Um, Mr. Lowenowski. Mr. Jalbert. Joe Lewandowski, L-A-W-E-N-D-O-W-S-K-I. I live in 39 Harrington Road in Chalta. Uh, and I've been sending messages back and forth to the siting board. And I keep on revising it because I have no more questions. And I don't really want to read these word for word. But I got some really, really key questions, right? You're talking about to put a two million gallon explosive device in a tight quarter, very close to a highway, very close to at least nine residences and four businesses on Route 169. Another nine residences on Harrington Road, and a great number of new residents in Southbridge, all very close. How anybody in their mind, in their even thought process, would think of putting that many people in that many facilities in such great danger? These facilities are not as safe as people say they are. You look at the articles, you can see many explosions, because people who take care of them do not take care of them. And that becomes a major problem in my, in my mind. So this site 
which is right on Route 169. It was surprised me where it was. I thought it would be back up in the woods, and I never knew there was a solar display area up there. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd to even think about something like that. And what is this company planning to do for the town? In case of an emergency, are they planning to train every single fire person and police department person in Charlton, Southbridge, Sturbridge, Webster, who will all be on common assist to come and assist? I've heard things that they've offered to only pay for one person from each of those departments. Come on, let's be real. That's a, that is absurd overall. And then you think of the size. What is the size of a two million gallon tank? He says, oh, look up at uh, a diesel tank up at Millennium. Now, Millennium a diesel is not explosive. This gas is an explosive device. What is the size of the trucks that are going to be done coming up and down the road? How many people really understand what you're facing in this situation? I had I had deep concerns about all of this. Now you're talking, oh, 169 is a better location. Why is it a better location? Because the company in charge of NEC is a hedge company and they're looking for a lowest cost solution. Now, that does not make sense to me. And then they're talking about, as I read in the article, this is going to be a hybrid solution which has never been done. You really want to be experimental you want to allow an experimental solution in Charlton? Come on, that does not make sense at all. And then you've got this site. How about people, you know, fire departments access in case of an emergency? Is there enough room on 11 acres? You want to put a big facility like that on only 11 acres? You want to put a facility on it like this on a hundred plus acres. So you have buffers around the actual plant. So that if there is some emission lake, as if there's some gas escaping, it has time to dissipate before it reaches the general public. You, I mean, it doesn't make any, I, none of this makes any sense to me. You know, is there enough water available? on site or for any uh, pipe thing. You know, I look at what you did, you know, this is, I see the reason for a facility in Charlton because of the pipeline, but I don't see this or Millennium as an ideal spot. You're at the original site one, in my opinion, is probably better, even though they talk about wetland protection, now, if they're concerned about wetlands, that means there's going to be runoff. There's going to be dangerous materials going into the ground. What about the people who live in that area? You know, I, I, I like I said, I have a long list. I don't really want to go through all every statement, but and then what is the real number of trucks? They talk about twelve a day. Come on, let's be real. It's got to be more than 12 a day. And they got to talk. And then you got 169. They're going to go to Route 20 anyways. These vehicles are going to Route 20 anyway. And you're going through, as the gentleman said, through one of the worst intersections in Charlton area. You want that to continue to happen. That would be a disaster. Any accident in that area. The closest access to the Mass Pike is the Route 20 location. Put a light there. Put warning signs that there's a light 
and have it activated when a truck is leaving that site. So that people know. I know it's not the greatest access point, you know, as I drive by it and check it, but there is a solution in that site. You know, and then ledge, I mean, they said it is the ledge over at that one 304 site. I can't believe it. There is nothing in life in Charlton that does not have ledge. <laughs> Absolutely nothing in my experience here in town. I don't care what your surveys say. They're going to be blasting. You're not going to put a pipeline along 169 without damaging the highway, which the state paid a massive amount of money to repair and put it into good running condition, right? And if you're going to come down from the pipeline through what I call a marine property, on through a wetland area, under a brook. You know, I don't see that as danger, but I see that as a concern, because most of the people don't pay attention to the ledges they get from your group, which has done an outstanding job as far as the presentation materials, but you have to take the time to read about it. I don't know what else to say. You know, if they want to come into town, let them pay 28.5 million for the new safety, building in town, let them guarantee so much a year to the town of Charlton, like Millennium does. They pay a million. I figure this would be worth at least five million a year or more. But that's my opinion. Don't sell the town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that, you know, that's it. I, I could go on forever, but I'm sorry for taking that time. I just hope that people think more clearly about where this site should be. Thank you. So let's try again. Um, Edward Jalbert. Waiver. I'm sorry? Oh, you don't wish to speak. Okay. Street. I just want to say I feel like I'm in the twilight zone because I've attended a lot of meetings and I do a lot of things in Worcester and I just want to know where's the traffic study now? Like it's really confusing that we're not able to look at these materials now. They changed the site or the pre preferred site but yet there's no specific traffic studies. Everything's coming down the road but yet this is the public comment night. And please don't think this is all the people in Charlton that care. There's Bruins on and there's a funeral in town, okay? So we're gonna make sure that people can write in before that deadline to let you know that this idea is insane, okay? Because when I see that map right there, zoom out of that map and you're gonna see we have, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the dump, LFG. Let's mix a lot of LFG that's gonna be here landfill gas for 30 years and let's add that next to the LNG which I'm also upset about because just yesterday I was on your website and it said 1 million gallons and I want to know why all these changes have been made since February yet your website's not being updated the health department's not being notified of meetings I'm not getting anything in the mail um, I just want to let you know I did start um, Facebook Citizens Against LNG in Charlton and I recommend everybody to go to it. So you can see, let's talk about the groups. What's upsetting me is that no one's mentioned any safety concerns here tonight other than what was brought up by people here. We're not talking about 
when we have the dump here, then we're gonna put in this LNG. Um, we have an airport right behind it all. Um, you know, it's a recipe for disaster. I just wanna know how much more Charlton can take. Like how much more do people in Charlton need to take? We had the Exxon situation, which caused water, severe, severe quality of life issues, okay? Then we have the landfill situation, which is capped off dump. And you go, I drive by it 14 times a day, and that's not a lie. <laughs> and it stinks, it's gross, and everybody promised, oh, we're gonna make it smell great all the time, every day. Like, you can come here and talk, 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 but you need to show more. I would have expected some presentation, like I have a video up, of what it looks like having all these tanker trucks 24 hours a day. And don't forget, your school buses are on Route 20. Your school buses are on 169. Okay, and we all know about the Treehouse Brewery, the poor planning that went into actually expanding when I myself witnessed two people taking three-point turns on Route 20 in the low-speed lane. What's gonna happen when that tanker truck comes flying down? Okay, it's just, it's unrealistic. I don't even know why we're wasting everybody's time to go even further without that traffic study. Okay, because I really believe at the end of the day, I don't think you're gonna be saying um, that the, it's gonna be reasonably necessary for the benefit of the public to put this uh, location, all these towns in danger. 169 is pretty much the only way in and out of Southbridge. Like you have no idea how much traffic that, that takes. I'm saying I don't care if you have one site, two site, three site. No, in Charlton. And I'm just gonna let you know. Your fight hasn't even started. You might think it's, oh, you've gotten away with it so far. You haven't. We've just started. And we're gonna make sure there's a sign in everybody's yard. And we're gonna hold you accountable to all these traffic studies. Um, I wanna know if, if LFG mixes with LNG and we have a, a situation whether it be human, mechanical, shrapnel, a plane falling into it, someone shooting it, um, because you know what no one's ever talked about too, doesn't this make us a nice international terrorist target? We now have a pipeline, we're gonna have two million uh, things of LNG at all times, all these trucks coming in and out, an airport right behind it, and a giant dump that, don't forget, had an eight day fire. Do you understand when a fire happens at these dumps? It's not tomorrow. It doesn't go out. It goes on and on and on. I mean, it is so much safety issues here that I find it hard to believe anyone on this panel can say, yes, people are child, and your lives are more, are less important than providing heat to people. Yes, heat's important, but it's not more important than our property, our value, our life. Don't forget, citizens against LNG and child. Thank you. wiped away houses. Right down in the corner, 169 and Route 20. Uh, lives gone, lives lost. Okay, what's gonna happen when the next hurricane comes? You didn't come here with one safety plan. I don't know anything about what your safety precautions are. I know nothing, and that's wrong. Thanks. Kirsty Hedgey. Good evening, my name is Kirsty Petchy. Um, I'm at, one, at Kirsty K-I-R-S-T-I-E, last name Petchy, P-E-C-C-I. I'm an environmental attorney, but I live at 138 McGilpin Road, which seems to be in the center of all the different scenarios that you've put together here. Um, I want to step us back a second, because we've talked a lot about the safety hazards, which are 
really real and should be considered very seriously by everybody. But I think we're ignoring another elephant in the room, which is fossil fuels are on their way out. Yes. This, is like, this is like putting a saddle factory in in 1930, okay? We're not gonna be using natural gas pretty soon. And while there's an argument that gas is less polluting in some ways than coal and oil, it is very polluting. And shame on you for expanding a system that has literally put the world on fire. <laughs> also, a step before that, this gas is coming, it's fracked gas. Look up fracked gas and what happens when you frack gas. Everywhere you frack gas, you are building a, basically a, a little mini Superfund site right there. You've got a, a pit of water that's contaminated. We don't even always know what the contaminants are. And this gas is not in any way, shape, or form, this gas we're getting, clean. And what I mean by that is, first of all, it's methane, right? So some of it is inevitably going to escape. Even if we don't have a horrific accident, or, you know, which, which could happen, even if we look, which just did happen, in fact, in Lawrence, if you remember, right? People died. People lost their homes. They're still cleaning that up. Even if you don't have that kind of a situation, methane is going to escape. The most, the, the best sealed methane containment is usually three to four percent escape. That's a daily type of thing. So that methane is going right into the environment, and that is one of the worst contaminants for, for uh, climate change. So methane should stay in the ground, keep the oil in the soil, okay? Furthermore, this frack gas is full of radon and other contaminants. Those toxics, just like the landfill gas, which is methane, but also has all those other contaminants in it, we can smell the landfill gas. At least you know when to go indoors because you're being you know, poisoned by that gas. This gas you won't be able to smell, maybe, but it's got those same contaminants in it. So that's another problem that we have to take very seriously. We're making, this facility will make everyone in the region sicker. And for what? All it's gonna do is slow down the transition we need to make to clean energy. And by clean, I don't mean burning landfill gas. I don't mean burning trash. I don't mean uh, you know these other false solutions. I mean wind. I mean solar. And we're seeing that transition locally. That's where the jobs are, and that's where the future is. So there is no reason for us to approve any of these um, alternatives. And that's a, this is a shell game. You know, keep people, you know, maybe it'll go there so it won't be near my home. It's going to be near all of our homes and it's unacceptable. So what I would ask is, first of all, we haven't really gotten a count because a lot of people don't like to speak. Who here is against this? If we could just have a quick, all right? And then secondly, please do call your reps and your senators. They should be here tonight. This is a travesty. So Senator Fatman, Senator Gobi, Representative Durant and Representative Smola, give them a ring tomorrow and let them know what you learned. I appreciate the time that you folks are putting into this. I know this is your job, but this is a travesty and should not happen. Thank you very much. Put that onus on any of these towns that have to 
to purchase equipment just for this one facility to go in. I don't think it's fair to the taxpayers of the town. The second concern which has been brought up many times is that I don't understand the reason for going to this site versus the new 20 site. Um, the 169 intersection at Route 20, as most people are probably, or everybody is familiar with here, is the one place where Route 20 goes down to one lane between Sturbridge and East of Auburn. This is a bottleneck to begin with, just with local traffic, particularly in the summer of the traffic. Do now add, you said 12 to 14 trucks a day, well, that's actually 24 to 28 vehicle trips, one in, one out per day at that intersection, which is going to keep triggering the light every time a truck goes <coughs> through it. So uh, I wasn't here and wasn't familiar with the Route 20 site. I understand you're saying there's wetlands and other environmental constraints, but the, you had proposed 12 acres on a 224-acre site. You're saying there isn't 12 acres of room that could be relocated and still keep it on that Route 20 site. The traffic of these trucks, as you, you have stated, are all going to Route 20, one way or the other, whether it's Route 169 or right out directly on Route 20. It seems to me that having traffic improvements on Route 20, <coughs> the intersection of the site from Route 20, might be more appropriate than bringing traffic down from Route, 20, route 169. Also, this, this is going to be consideration for 169 the 169 site, I would recommend that they consider about what is usually known as the J-Freak on the trucks to uh, post that they're not allowed to be used. These are residential areas, both at the entranceway to the site and the entranceway to Route 20, that they have, they do post the areas for the trucks not to use those J-Freaks. They're gonna be running a 24-hour operation. The residents in those areas aren't going to be going to be listening to them, so. That would just be a recommendation should be considered that site. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Holmquo. Uh, Joe Haleva, H O L E W A. Uh, 94 Bled Road, Chatham, Mass. So I attended the first meeting and I applied to be an intervener uh, for this process. I thought it might be useful to have a private citizen to be an intervener. Um, I got some feedback that maybe I'd be better off as a limited participant, um, mostly because I think the reason was I wouldn't bring experts to the table. Well. What I'd like you to know is I uh, work for Harvard University as a contract manager. I've been there for eight years. I work with Harvard University's top attorneys, OGC. Um, I also work closely with the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And my plan was to ask a few engineers there to be interns on this project. Um, so that was my plan. Um, I was also the former uh, zoning board chairman of town of Dudley. And um, I do have a, a real strong concern that I want to talk to Mr. Avery about, which is they're applying for a total exemption of zoning bylaws. So the bylaws that you voted in as a town and were smart enough to do, they're saying, doesn't apply to our project. And they're saying, well, maybe it's a you know, square pig and a round hole, that type of thing, okay? But if you think about it, that's exactly why the zoning bylaws were put into place. There's a process you go through. You go to the zoning board, and if you, you, you file for a variance, right? And you have a discussion with the board, you invite the neighbors in to find out what the concerns are, the abutters. Based on that um, a, a process, you either vote in a variance or not. You know, the example he gave with the tank, Okay, it's above ground, it's for safety. I get it, that's why you go to the zoning board, you explain that, and you get a variance for that. So I'm not, if you're, if you're gonna let this go into the Department of Public Utilities and let them decide for you uh, how this is gonna affect you, good luck, 
Um, I don't I don't agree with that at all. I had an open mind in November when these folks came here. Okay, that's rapidly being changed. My confidence in these guys have really has gone downhill for that one very fact of zoning. I don't think it's fair to the town of Chowton, not fair to me, or my wife or kid uh, or family. So it's something you really should make known to your state rep, state senator, your, the governor. I'll tell you, Governor Baker does listen. When we had that fatal accident on Route 20, my wife was almost in that. We called uh, the governor's office and um, he showed up. So uh, so anyway, so that, that is, you know, you, it does make a difference. Make those phone calls. The second thing I'm gonna say is two million gallons of uh, LNG. Each gallon has 84,000 BTUs of energy. Two million gallons, get this, is the equivalent energy of not one, not two, but three atomic bombs that leveled Hiroshima, okay? That's what you're storing up there. So you figure out, okay, and there's never been, and these engineers will testify to this, I'm sure, there's never been a large-scale test of a release of LNG gas anywhere in the world. There's been accidents, but they've done simulations in a lab, they've done small releases, they've done some tests, but never a large-scale test that did, you know, tons of LNG gas to see what happens. Theoretically, this stuff will eventually dissipate into the air. A cloud will form and it'll go someplace. But if that cloud goes into a enclosed airspace and you have approximately 15% of oxygen, you're gonna get an explosion like you've never seen before, okay? So you have every right here to be very concerned about this. Um, I'm gonna do my best to make sure that you're informed I'm going to make sure hold these people accountable because they need to be held accountable. You don't want this without really the due process that it's going to have to go through. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Richard McGrath. Richard McGrath, MCGRATH, I don't want Sawmill Circle and Child. And uh, kind of going last, and a lot of people stole my thunder. There is uh, uh, articles on the town warrant that what wasn't heard uh, before this because the meeting ended, which are coming up in two weeks, that changes the zoning to allow a special permit for not only liquid gas, but it even talks about nuclear and other energy sources so that it can be put into areas such as residential and uh, the planning board is, is the sponsor of those articles which I'm kind of concerned about. One of the things I read prior to this in the telegram was the phrase energy corridor. Route 169 was an energy corridor and it was mentioned by one of the gentlemen from NEC uh, tonight. Uh, it's got a subliminal, subliminal message that this is what's going to already go in. And with the, the information of the fact that they can go and bypass our uh, zoning by just going to the state and telling us that we don't matter, it tells me that something's already in the works. And I'm very concerned by the fact that, although we are vo voicing our concern tonight, that whatever process has already started, whatever deals have been made through the town um, or wherever, that money talks and we mean nothing. And I'm very concerned that I'm going to speak up at our continued town meeting in regards to Article 19 and 20, which are specifically towards the uh, rezoning and allowing energy facilities to go by on a special permit where a half a dozen people in the town get to decide what's best for everybody else. And we don't have much of a say and I'm concerned that our voices are not going to be heard tonight. Although you guys guarantee us, the Merrimack Valley people, uh, the gas people up there, guaranteed safety to Lawrence North Andover and Andover, and just to clean it up there too. And they said, well, that was just a mistake. Well, 
people make mistakes, the people are going to be building this facility. Thank you, Mr. Ed Copley. Emissions 
is much higher when, running, when you are running on oil. There is no magic bullet, there is no silver lining. We have to work jointly, we have to figure out how to work jointly. We have to figure out how to establish trust between everybody and finding the best solution uh, for any energy projects. None of energy is safe if it's not handled safely. I don't want to make clear on the record that LNG is not explosive material, so let's be sure about this. And you can see appropriate treatment of electric uh, transmission and distribution, like at Pacific Gas and Electric, appropriate treatment to gas, appropriate treatment of oil, everything does require safe, professional, and high technology approach to this. And we do so, believe me. that this facility will meet this threshold. So, 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 so again, I, I guess everybody in the room knows that gas is less polluting than oil uh, or coal, uh, but you, you ask for our trust, you ask for the neighbor's trust. And the truth of the matter here is, is that you're here for money. It's about money. The environmental side and, and all the other stuff is sort of on the fringe. It's about money. And for the state, it, it's about you know trying to find energy solutions for the Commonwealth. Um, obviously, I, I mean, my national grid, this is the National Grid Associated Project, my, my electric bill has gone up double. I don't have solar on my roof. So, so much for future planning and everything. I mean, I'm using less electricity and paying twice as much money. Um, I really think that, you know, we have what, another two weeks for comments? And comments on what? There's nothing here to really come that we don't, like I said, no traffic study, no, no, they haven't been to any other boards. I would suggest that they go to these other boards, go to the, 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 the uh, you know, the select board, go to the planning board, get through that process, and then start the thing, because then people here can come and talk intelligently about what their questions really are, not going by a news article uh, that was written the other day, okay? So, and with that said, as far as the town of is concerned, I am getting fed up with uh, all these, big companies and everybody wanting to come to town, um, tell us all about how great they are and all the things that they're going to do, and uh, no financial impact report. We didn't get one from PGG. But I didn't get one from the selector. Before you even start this, you guys should have been here with a financial impact report. You've had plenty of time to look at different sites. You've been doing this for a year. There should be a financial impact report so we all know as residents what is going to happen here and how it's going to affect us financially as well as health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Crouchy. Thanks, Ben. 
probably a long time working up. We went out in the 20, which on the surface seemed like the best thing. Um, that one, as I discovered from Mr. Cochran's <coughs> announcement, it probably had a meeper requirement, so we dodged that. So instead of going away from here with some real information and some real encouragement that this is something we want to really look for, I'm really disappointed that they've been, well, maybe ill-prepared and maybe um, obtuse and exclusive and not involuntary. And to me, that's a big red flag. And I'm not looking for the spot because you had your chance. Thank you.
the Niger Delta, found to influence diseases such as asthma, cough, respiratory difficulty, eye and skin irritation. Also, health implications of long time exposure to emissions from gas flaring on some human hematological parameters investigated revealed striking deterioration in hematological parameters. Exposure of residents around gas flare sites to emissions from the gas was reported to reduce peak expiratory flow rate. That's how you can breathe. That's how your children can breathe. Peak expiratory flow rate, respiratory morbidities. That's dying. Skin disorders and other related health risks. So I wanna move up to where they discuss in this report the different toxins that come out of these flares. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Globally, gas flaring is recognized as a colossal waste of natural resources, which is about 150 billion cubic meters flared annually. Flared gas is a major contributor to global warming and climate change. So, volatile organic chemicals, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, PAC, particulate matter, PM, black carbon, that pollutes the air, soil, and water. Over 250 toxins, such as hydrogen sulfide, toluene, tol toluene benzene, sulfur dioxide, benzoprine, nitrogen dioxides, xylene, etc., have been identified with flaring gas. These pollutants, especially PM and the precursor gases emitted, have been reported to have adverse health effects on the environment and human health. Now to the points about Southbridge. Because if you look at the topography of the region where they're proposing putting this flaring site, I mean, I don't know enough about engineering to talk about the tank, but it's a valley. It's down in a valley. There is a 130 foot elevation change directly behind the proposed site on 169. Why do you put a flare in a valley and who is downwind of that? You know who's downwind of that? Thousands of Southbridge residents with kids who have just been exposed to a tornado and a super landfill and have their water polluted for hundreds of years. Thousands of kids downwind. I don't know if they bothered to do a study of the prevailing winds and the effects of wind on topography, but I haven't heard anything about it today or how you plan to handle it. So my other question is, what I think I heard was that we're not gonna benefit from this. This gas, if I'm correct, and please somebody feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, is going to other parts of the state. Southbridge and Charlton aren't going to be fed by this plant. You guys aren't selling us gas locally. These trucks aren't gonna come and get us and serve our houses, correct? No, I have one question for you. The question is, are, are we gonna be getting natural gas from this plant in Southbridge and Charlton? Yes, as discussed in today's presentation, we'll start to supply gas to businesses and facilities in Charlton. You're gonna supply natural gas to businesses in Charlton? Right. And nobody else? I mean, we don't have pipeline to anybody else. And second, as you gave me an opportunity to speak, uh, References to gas flare. Um, I didn't know. I'm sorry, this is my time. Please sit down. I'm not done. I had one question for you and you've answered it. Please sit. Thank you. So, I'd like to know how many of the people from these companies live in Southbridge or Charlton? Any? Is there one? Please. Yes, you may answer. Yes, the owner of the business lives in Charlton. The owner of which business? In common. In common. What are they doing? They're a manufacturer of fiber optic materials. So, Incom lives, the owner of that company 
which is going to be running this facility, lives in Charlton. What is Incom's role in this in this business? It's a business. It's not us. It's a separate business. Right. I'm not talking about Incom. I'm talking about your facility, the the gas facility. Do any of the owners of the companies live in Charlton or Southbridge? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next question. Um, how many of the investors in this facility live in Southbridge or Charlton? State stakeholders, stockholders of the companies. Any of them? Can we have an yeah, please. <laughs> yes, you may. Thank you. It would be appreciated. Um, not in Charlton, Southbridge, in Worcester County. We have a, a broader set of investors throughout the Commonwealth, but no, not in uh, not all of anyone in Charlton or Southbridge. Okay, I have a few other, I, I think maybe, can I, I have a few other questions for him? Maybe he can answer about that? Yes, um, proceed. Thank you. Um, so how many of your investors in this company and the companies associated with it live in the United States and what percentage are United States citizens or companies and what percentage are foreign entities? May we answer? Yes, you may. 100% U.S. citizens or U.S. institutions. So no money from this facility will be leaving this country? Correct. Good to hear. All right. So. Quick question on the septic tank. Um, because I want to follow up from one of the very insightful questions about wastewater from the previous speaker. You said that you were going to have a septic tank on your property to handle your wastewater? May we answer? Yes, you may. Thank you. I mean, the facilities we discussed will have the most three people. Whatever the requirement for these three people on site would be met through existing wastewater uh, pipelines available or through a septic tank on site. So that's so for human waste? Correct, three planes. And you have no water disposal from your industrial process whatsoever? Correct. We don't use water in our industrial process. All right, so it's only human waste. Correct. Good to know. All right? I think I'm through my list. Let me have one last look. Oh, here, yeah, I wanted to, thank you very much, sir. Um, just a quick note to the board. In thinking about siting a facility like this, because I recognize that we have energy needs in our state that need to be fulfilled in many different ways as we proceed in ev the evolution of energy consumption, I think it's probably better to site a facility like this, as somebody referred to before, in a place where it doesn't have such a direct impact on the local population, that there aren't residences so close to it, that you look at something like the flare and it being in a valley and the impact on air quality for thousands of residents less than a mile, two miles away. Our town center in Southbridge is two miles away. Uh, we have thousands of people living there. Uh, and so what my hope is, is in, in looking at a potential alternative to this site, uh, would be to look for a place that has a higher elevation so that that flare, when, when it releases the gases um, from the processing of the natural gas, that it's not released in a valley where it can be funneled and channeled towards people's homes. Um, so I would encourage you to look for an alternative site where people aren't living, where, as somebody very astutely recommended, you have some buffer around it. 11 acres is very small. It's a very small buffer zone. Um, we haven't talked about the kill zone, if there's an explosion, but part of that is obviously also fumes, toxic fumes, um, and where that air is going to travel. And with the prevailing winds as they stand coming through that valley, any resident can tell you they're coming from the west, they're going east, and that takes anything that comes out of that factory and sends it right into downtown Southbridge. So I hope that you'll consider that and encourage this company who has, I'm sure, hundreds of miles of pipeline in Massachusetts to choose from. 
to look for somewhere where there aren't 15,000 people two miles away. Thank you.
to make sure that our children and our grandchildren and the generations that will come uh, behind us uh, have a, a habitable planet. It deeply concerns me to hear you speak about swooning us with the rhetoric or the narrative that gas uh, is safe. It's not. From production to transmission to distribution, including an LNG plants, there is absolutely nothing safe about gas. In fact, let me read you from this brilliant physician who came to Worcester a few weeks ago. This is scientific data, by the way. Natural gas is associated with hazardous, hazardous air pollutants, volatile organic compounds like benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. What do they do? I'll tell you. They affect the nervous system, they cause cancer, can cause birth defects. There are no safe levels. According to the EPA report dated February 2017, it's confirmed that drilling, which is basically fracking, which is basically what you're bringing into Massachusetts, it's impacting drinking water. So a lot of Americans live around water sources that's located within a mile of fracking well. Do you know what else fracked gas does to mothers and expected mothers before they give birth? They affect their children in their womb. I'm sure you have wives, daughters, sisters, aunts, women, mothers that you care about. That's what you're doing. That's what you're bringing to our community. At a time when we are facing a climate emergency, nobody on this panel, no one on this panel, should be advocating for things like this to, to be expanded into our communities. I don't live in Charlton, and I feel really bad for what that brilliant woman in the back talked about. The fact that we have absolutely no guarantee that your facility is going to be a safety point for the children that are going to be contending and the, bus, the buses that are going to be uh, running in the same highway that your trucks, which you're not telling us the size of them either, are going to be running against or next to. Your trucks are going to be traveling next to bus, um, school buses, uh, residents, people, and you are sitting here telling us that this is okay, that this is, that there's no, that there's, they're, they're foolproof. There aren't Canada. Uh, Texas, Tennessee, there's plenty of sites. In, in fact, Providence, our neighbor Providence, they fought really, really, really hard to not bring an LNG facility because the people there, environmental justice communities, recognize that natural gas is not natural and there's nothing, absolutely nothing healthy about natural gas. It is dirty gas. It needs to stay on the ground. And I really, really hope, I know you are all appointed by Governor Baker, not a friend of, of, the, of the climate justice community. Just follow the money and see how many um, fossil fuel industry are, are currently contributing to this campaign. The Weymouth compressor, I don't know if y'all have been um, following the Weymouth compressor fight, but this, the, the environmental impact or the health impact study that they just committed, it was, a, it was, it was fraudulent. They found the carcinogens that were going to be emitted within the, the, the radius mile of the, um, of the Weymouth compressor. Our mothers, I know I'm not speaking on behalf of mothers out front today, but I do have to share this story because it is very important for people to hear that there's power in organizing. I don't care how much power you think you have, there's power in organizing. The Cayuga plant in New York currently was shut down, Same, similar facilities to yours, 14 to 48 trucks running through that highway every single day. Mothers and residents got together and were able to revert the permit. And now they're considering doing a renewable energy plan. That's what we should be moving. Your stakeholders and your investors shouldn't be investing in fossil fuel. That needs to stay on the ground. And I'm upset. I'm upset because I have two small children at home that are going to be impacted by expanded fossil fuel infrastructure. That's what that is. And we don't need that in our communities. We don't need that in Charlton, Southbridge. We don't need that in Worcester County. We don't need that in Massachusetts, period. There needs to be a moratorium on all fossil fuel um, pipelines, period. Thank you.
Lisa Whiting, it's M-E-L-I-S-S-A. Whiting is W-I-D-I-N-G. I live at 89 H Foot Road, Charlton Mass. H Foot Road, Charlton Mass. Uh, as many of you have spoken about tonight, uh, my husband and I are living the nightmare with Casella. This is our fourth year of contaminated water. Um, we have been very outspoken. We've spoken with state reps. We've spoken with the EPA. We've spoken with the DPC. We've been very involved with a number of organizations. Um, we, we attend every board of health meeting. You'll we'll see us all over the town. Everybody knows who we are. Um, we are not only homeowners. We've lived our entire lives in Charlton. Um, we've been homeowners for 21 years, as I said, dealing with the crap for four years with Casella, using bottled water. Um, my husband also owns a company in town. My big concern, one of my big concerns uh, for us, is that it's a welding company. And so he's one of two welding companies, whether you know that or not, in the area. So with this gas being out there, I want to know how you can guarantee that if some big cloud comes along, some leak happens, some sort of something happens, that we're not going to go poof because he's running a welding business and a half mile down the road on Commercial Drive um, is another welding business. Our business is directly behind Incom and Mr. Denarando, um, who's here in the audience this evening. We're directly behind, so if you walk a straight path through the trees, you get to our house. That is a huge concern. That is a very huge concern. Um, so I'd like some, some information about how you can guarantee that we don't need to be concerned for ourselves, for our business, for our family, for our workers. Um, that's a huge concern. Uh, safety is priority number one for us because it's only one way to stay in business and everybody in the LNG community will subscribe to the Massachusetts code and LNG has been safe in Massachusetts for more than half a century. Overall, when we talk about LNG, and I do want to respond to a few kind of questions that have been raised, that is one of the most effective energy storages. So when we look for holy grail right now in the renewable economy, in the future economy, we do look for efficient storage solution. Advantage of LNG is the storage, and that's why it's present in, as we discussed in Boston, Cape Cod, Providence, Springfield, Philadelphia, any major city. In a city that is much higher density than uh, what we are looking on this map. Uh, why is it important? Because you are trying to position your storage close to consumption point. You're trying to position storage, and storage in Boston is 30 times of this same storage. So we are talking about much bigger facilities, much um, higher density population. And this solution is popular because it doesn't use any chemicals like electric battery. This facility does not need to go into landfill at any point, like electric battery, when you need to dispose. And these types of facilities, they can run through a polar vortex. There is not yet an electric battery that can run for a few days or two weeks or three weeks. LNG does. Same as you, everybody is looking for future solutions. Same as you, we continue technological improvements. There are no secrets in this. There was another question that came up. What does it mean, a hybrid solution? Hybrid solution means, in this case, that we are considering at this point to use a hybrid drive. Usually in Massachusetts, most of facilities are gas-driven, so you have a gas turbine, as Mark explained. And just to put this turbine in perspective, we are talking about that. 8 megawatt turbine, uh, millennium station, just to put it in scale, is 360 megawatt turbine. So it's a relatively small gas turbine. To reduce this turbine even more, we will be using a hybrid solution, so it will be this gas turbine plus electric motor. So this is same hybrid solution is being used in Toyota Prius when you drive Toyota Prius. When you need to accelerate, you use electric battery. When you need to slow down, you use electric battery. And engine runs consistently, and that's why you can choose a smaller frame for the gas turbine. So there are no secrets about this stuff, and that is why in every major city in the United States with much high density, 
you have facilities like LNG facilities, and they serve Massachusetts really well. They do have a stellar safety record. And frankly, if you compare safety record of LNG relative to any other energy source, it beats any other energy source, hands down. But it is important issue. Facility will have state-of-the-art safety equipment, and um, and as discussed, we'll continue to work with every stakeholder, and we'll acknowledge we try to reach to everybody in town. Some people took our call, with some people we still need to meet. We glad that the dialogue will continue. We definitely respond and will participate in the report June 11. Week. So we'll continue the dialogue and we'll continue the dialogue with everybody from the audience because the only one way to build the right facility is to take everybody's opinion into account. Mr. Kuchowski also had asked this evening about odor and that was never addressed. He was one of the first people to ask. Yeah, there is no odor from these facilities. We discussed that it is a closed loop facility. So nothing, there are no smell. If you go to Springfield near the LNG tank, if you go to Boston, you will not be able to sense any odor. Um, one of the things that we heard from Casella quite a bit was that there are good neighbors and um, everyone comes in and wants to be a good neighbor, but good neighbors don't take care of their neighbors like this. Um, so I want to make that point that you're really coming into a neighborhood where you're sandwiching in people that are already dealing with four years of nonsense that was nothing of their doing and now you are literally putting us in the middle of two horrible situations. Horrible, absolutely horrible. We don't want it, we didn't want Casella, we, we have no interest in this, this is not benefiting us. Mm -hmm. And if I might say that, humbly suggesting that pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 3, this project is not reasonably necessary for the convenience or welfare of the public. It's not convenient, it's not necessary, it's not beneficial, and certainly you're not doing anything for Charlton by bringing it here. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whiting. As I mentioned, I don't have any more people signed up to speak, but I'd like to ask you all if there's anyone who would like to speak but, but didn't actually sign up on the sheet. Sorry, once again, Bill Borowski, 69 Haggerty Road. Um, through the hearing officer, this is for Mr. Avery and team. One of the concerns I think many of us have had over the past couple of years is the number of solar farms that have moved in. And that policy aside, one of the assumptions was that we were going to receive X amount of tax revenue. Because of legislative slash tax loopholes, we are potentially going to see a fraction of that and we will be left on, on the hook. So my question to the hearing officer, to Mr. Avery, I just want like to hear someone go on record that the organization of the company has every intention of paying every single dollar, if approved, of tax money. There will be no pursuit of tax or legislative loopholes, that there is no nonprofit status that we're not aware of, that for all intents and purposes, that again, being a good neighbor, that again, if approved, that we will see every single tax dollar that we are supposed to get. Does the company wish to respond? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Avery. I think I'll give you a simple answer. Yes, uh, there, there are these same sort of exemptions available that the solar industry develops. I represent some of them. Uh, this, this, the company's been working good faith on, on those issues. Uh, and, and it is one of the benefits, I guess you would say. Uh, there's another benefit that I don't think we talked a little bit about, we didn't talk much about, but um, some of the storms that you have, having there's some the concept of resilience when you have these bad storms and long outages, perhaps there may be some synergies that could benefit the, the Charlton community. <coughs> yeah, yeah. could restore civilization and, and, and utilities and, and power and things much more quickly to people in the medium city of this area. So there, there hopefully will be some good things and they're working in good faith on the tax issue as you discussed. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Is there anyone else who 
might like to ask a question of the company or provide some comments. Can I? Here. I just have one more point. Um, Pamela Paquin, 16 Ellis Road, Southbridge. This is just a, in response to one of the women who live near this site who just spoke. Uh, talking about Boston and uh, liquid uh, natural gas facilities being safe and comparing it to Boston. Well, this is what they say about the Boston facility in terms of how it's protected to keep it safe. Uh, with September 11, 2001 in mind, the Coast Guard coordinates an armada of protection for each trip in and out of the liquid natural gas facility in Boston. A helicopter, police divers, marine patrol, environmental police, firefighting tugs, city police boats, and Coast Guard vessels. Are we going to get all of that for our giant tank of two million gallons of liquid natural gas? What do you guys think? This is one of the rare cases when the public hearing can find an answer really quickly. Actually, this facility helped to displace the quote is related to the Everett facility, which is an import LNG facility. So when the vessel comes from Yemen, when the vessels come from overseas, it is export, uh, escorted by National Guard. So this facility, Everett facility, is um, this imported facility. and unreliability of this facility and security issues, they drive actually need for homemade, Massachusetts made LNG. And that is one of the reasons why this facility is in public need and public interest. And I also want to address probably the previous question too. This facility does not expand use of fossil fuels. So this is not an enlarging of the pipelines. This is not creating new customers. So this facility effectively displaces oil. So LNG is a little more expensive than natural gas, so it doesn't compete, doesn't promote for natural gas. We don't have more throughput of natural gas through the pipeline. What we do, you have two options during really cold winter in this environment. You can switch to oil or you can switch to liquid natural gas. And the choice is relatively straightforward from economics point of view because LNG is two or three times cheaper than oil, so it's attractive and environmentally it's safe. It is a solution that will continue to work, it will continue to improve. Same, we will continue to look for better technologies, how to advance it. But in today's environment, there is nothing else which during polar vortex can run for two months than LNG. So in this case, we are displacing Georgia fossil fuel is cleaner fuels. So this is the concept of this facility and it does not expand uh, consumption of fossil fuels. Thank you. Uh, I'll check one more time. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak tonight? Richard McGrath, I say it was MCG, RATH from Sawmill Circle, and I spoke before. You guys uh, talked very well about how uh, natural gas is uh, a lot better than oil, a lot better than coal, and all the rest. Um, that doesn't affect us in any way. The town of Charlton gets no benefit from this. We're not going to get natural gas lines put into our homes. And if we did, we're not going to get it at a reduced rate. You talk about getting your product closer to the consumer. We're not your consumers. The only thing that we incur in this is a liability for safety and a liability in property values. This doesn't help Charlton at all in any way, shape, or form other than what you might give to the town at a tax base, which we could get from other industry and other businesses. But this doesn't help us, doesn't help the end consumer here and having a cleaner burning furnace in our homes because we don't have gas lines in our homes. Before we go off the record, I 
will take this opportunity to encourage those who are interested in further involvement in this case to investigate the possibility of intervening or participating as a limited participant. Remember, however, that petitions to do so must be received by the citing board no later than 5 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday, June 12, 2019. And I want to make one uh, point about this deadline um, as clearly as I can, which is I believe it was Ms. Downen asked if she could have an extension of time to allow her to attend the June 13th uh, town meeting. And I asked her to submit her request to me in writing, um, including email. I don't want anyone here thinking that that was a general waiver of the June 12th deadline. The June 12th deadline is the June 12th deadline. Now, if anyone else here thinks that they need an additional day or some amount of additional time to get your petition in, you need to do the same thing that she's going to do, which is to send me an email requesting X number of additional days and providing a good reason why you should be given additional days. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, it was not a waiver of the June 12th deadline. It applies to everyone. It may even apply to her. I haven't granted her a request for additional time yet. Could you um, tell, speak out loud your email so that it could be broadcast? Oh, you want my email address? Yes. Please. Sure. It's K A T H R Y N dot S E D O R at mass.gov. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so again, that June 12th deadline is the deadline for petitions to intervene or to participate. Written comments, if they can be filed um, by June 12th, that's very helpful. But as I said at the beginning of the hearing tonight, written comments uh, will be received by the citing board at any time. We will review them. They will go into the official docket for the case. Right, and as a further reminder, copies of the citing board's rules for intervening and participating if there are any copies left, uh, are available at that table outside the, the door. Um, also, um, we staff will be here for a few minutes after we close the, the hearing now, um, and we would be happy to talk with you um, briefly or answer any questions you might have right now about how to intervene or become a limited participant. So, um, thank you all very much for coming tonight and for your comments and your questions. Um, and on behalf of staff, I wish you a good evening. Thank you.